All right, thank you. I had no idea I was going to go after Mike, um, and I haven't heard Mike's talk. I'm going to take you from 15,000 square miles to six. Uh, but what's what's fun is that Diatom still run the show. Can, oh, it's not a presentation mode. Sorry. Oh yeah. I learned recently that uh, fish don't smell fishy; they smell diatomy. The, the the pufas, right? The, that that make up most allergies are what give fish their fishy smell. So that's fun. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today um, is uh, some of the questions that are driving my research. Um, and you know, one of the bedrocks of ecology, one of the bedrock questions of ecology, is what drives the distribution and abundance of organisms across the landscape and through time. You can translate into that into what I would call the bedrock question of ecological management, which was how does the distribution and abundance of organisms change in response to variables we can affect? Um, and in rivers, we try to answer this question frequently, especially with the amount of water, the quantity of flow with suitability models. So we'll take a look at a focal species, call it you know, a steelhead or a salmon, we'll say um, here's the range of depths and velocities we find this organism in, here's the range of uh, water temperatures we find this organism in. If we can model those and if we can uh, create those conditions, uh, through dam management or something else, we ought to be able to see the distribution and abundance of these animals we care about go where we want them to go. Um, it's not that easy. And uh, one of the reasons it's not that easy, uh, John uh, I mean, uh, Muir told us, right, uh, in, in nature everything's connected to everything else. This goes for preference and suitability as well. You know, um, on Sunday I don't eat Cheetos because I think that the 49ers always lose when I eat Cheetos. But I eat Cheetos every other day of the week. So my preference for Cheetos is affected by the 49ers playing. Um, if you're a steelhead uh, in a pool, uh, your preference for depth and velocity and water temperature are affected by a host the biological interactions, competition, predation, facilitation. They're affected by the phenology and seasonality of the food web that you're responding to. Um, they're, they're affected by a whole lot of things. And so suitability won't be the same through time and space. So if we want to answer questions about how, when does the environment change in important ways, is there another way we can ask that question? So what I'm really interested in is can we ask it from the bottom up? So rather, uh, rather than imposing um, suitability models to predict when physical habitat changes, that's going to predict when the, when the fish abundance is going to change. Can we actually ask the fish, the fish in that environment to tell us when the environment changes in important ways using their behavior? So that's the first thing I've done, um, or attempted to do, as I have not done, I'm attempted to do. Uh, this research was done in the Eel River watershed, the South Fork Eel at the Angelo Coast Range Reserve of UC Berkeley. Um, and I studied Elder Creek, which is a beautiful, pristine stream, um, uh, tributary to the South Fork, six and a half square miles. You can swim through the pools and drink the water while you're studying, which is nice. Um, so I wanted to get a handle on fish behavior. What are the fish doing in the pools that I'm studying? So we filmed them. Um, we filmed them uh, in seven different pools through the summer of 2016. I filmed them uh, twice a month in the morning and in the evening. And you can see my video mount in a monumented location in each side of the, in, in, in each location of the pool that I, that I studied. And the way I used the video work was I used uh, VidSync, which is a stereo video program developed by Jason Newswanger out of Fairbanks, Alaska. He's at Georgia now. Um, and what the program does is it allows you to take two streams of video that are in stereo of the same location, put it through a post-processing routine, and turn it into a three-dimensional searchable image. So I can actually track fish through space, look at their velocity, look at their occupied volumes um, in time and space. Um, so it's a fun program. So I come to a pool that I care about, I sneakily put my camera in and I leave for a couple hours so the fish can go back to normal. They swim around in front of my camera and do their thing. And then I come and, and stomp into the pool with my big calibration frame, put that in there, I can go back to that in the video and use it in the post-processing. And then you need lots of undergrads to do your work for you. Um, so, <laughs> and I have excellent, uh, excellent undergrads who are helping me. So what, what does this produce? This produces a lot of different types of data, but one of the types of data it produces is the location of occupied volumes of fish in, in real space. So the red points you're seeing, or the, the different points you're seeing on this three-dimensional graph here are the nose point locations of uh, six different steelhead in an Elder Creek pool in May um, every three seconds. So I track them every three seconds. So it's pretty labor intensive to collect it. What can we ask with this data set? So um, uh, steelhead are, are primarily drift feeding fish, right? They're fish that like to occupy a low energy environment near a high energy environment where they can pick off drifting prey as it moves through their pool. Um, but that doesn't always 
work. It doesn't work, for example, if you're not the biggest, baddest fish in the pool and you're downstream somewhere where you can't drift feed. It doesn't work if the environment changes in such a way that drift feeding doesn't become favorable. So sometimes they'll change their behavior to being search feeding fish, swimming around the pool, looking for prey to pick off, looking at the surface for adults to land on the water. They'll also change their behavior in response to fluxes of food, to all kinds of other things. So I wondered, I wondered if we could use these point locations of fish to ask questions about what they're doing, right? This is something fisheries biologists have been doing for years qualitatively. I mean, a good fisheries biologist can swim in this pool and tell me what they're doing, but it's hard to quanti quantify it. And if you can't quantify it, you can't sell managers on it a lot of the time. So this is a way to quantify, I guess, something that's been intuitively done for years. So I could find, I can identify a centroid point, which is the median X, or the mean XYZ location that this, that this fish occupied in space. So you can think of this as a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional image. And then I can ask some questions about that. I can say, on average, how far did the fish range from that centroid point? So is its occupied volumes dispersed or concentrated? If you can, you can think if you're a drift feeding fish, you're gonna be, have high focal point affinity. You're gonna come back to that point and stay there. Um, or maybe if you're a sheltering fish, you're not drift feeding, but you want to stay out of, out of sight, you're also going to have that same pattern. But if you're swimming all around the pool, you're going to have a wide dispersed point. That's one thing. Another thing we can do is we can track the fish in time. So this is, you've watched the blue arrows here. Um, so I can track in each time step. And I can say how much uh, distance per time is the fish putting on, which, is, which is, can also be, uh, with some black magic, uh, can turn into an energy expenditure uh, analysis. So this is data that you could use in bioenergetics, for example. So if we clump all the pools that I studied in Elder Creek um, into a box, part, box plot chart, um, and we have distance through time on the y-axis here, and we have the months um, on the x-axis, you can see that fish are traveling in higher distance through time between May and June and July and dropping again in August. Now, I don't have stream flow on this. Stream flow goes from about um, seven or eight cubic feet per second down to about 0 0.8 cubic feet per second. Um, <clears throat> but it's an interesting pattern, right? Um, flow is lower in July than it was in May, but it's lower in August than it was in July. And you see this increasing uh, movement and then, and then a sharp drop off. Um, the second analysis here, we can look at this uh, median distance move from a centroid point. This is the same data set. Um, uh, and you, the pattern isn't as clear here, right? There's a little little dip in, in, in June, an increase in July, and then a slight drop off in August, but the pattern's not as clear. So what's going on? <clears throat> wow, this chart is not showing half of it. Um, so <laughs> there's a green bar where the white is underneath that. And this is uh, where we look at scan samples. So we're going to look at the video um, and every 10 seconds we're going to stop it. We're going to watch it for five seconds and we're going to count the number of fish engaged in different behaviors. The number of drift feeding fish, the number of roaming fish, the number of sheltering fish, the number of fish who are feeding on the benthos. And then we can plot that against drift rate. And if you can imagine the white bars as green bars or the empty space as green bars, you'll see the proportion of drift feeding fish is dropping with the drift. Nice and logical. But in July here, and this is what we're not seeing, is you have a whole bunch of diversity of behavior. You've got fish who are feeding on the benthos, fish who are feeding on the surface, fish who are drift feeding, fish who are sheltering. July was the, the most rich time to try everything you can do to get that last little bit of food before things fall apart in August. Okay. So following my logic at the beginning of the talk, what's driving these changes in behavior? How can we point back to physical and food web dynamics as driving these changes in fish behavior and then how can we manage the stream to protect those things? Um, <clears throat> Food web phenology is something we focus on a lot in our lab, the seasonality of the food web, and I think it's important and I think it's under underused in, in management. Um, so I measured, as an index of this, I measured incoming drift into my pools, in each one of my pools. Um, we collected all the bugs. We did this uh, evening and morning for two hours throughout the summer uh, on bi-weekly intervals. We use length weight regressions to estimate biomass of each of the bugs that are coming into, the, into my <coughs> drift nets and lots of wonderful undergrad research again to help me pick the bugs out of the, out of the mess, key them out, um, something like 5,000 bugs we did from last summer. Um, so if we plot now two different indices of drift coming into my pool, right? on the top you see biomass uh, per time. So this is biomass per, per hour. 
um, it's high when flow is high and it drops down to low. Also, the diversity of biomass changes dramatically. The second below this here is rate, the number of bugs per time that's drifting in, into the pools. Also drops from early season to late season, um, although uh, May and June are much higher relative uh, in, in terms of their diversity. Now let's turn this into a concentration. This is where I think things get really interesting. Um, if we take those same metrics, but we divide them per unit flow. So if you have 100 CFS and 100 bugs, but you have, and then you compare that to one CFS or 10 CFS and, and three bugs, right? Concentration is really important in terms of uh, how you're gonna respond to the environment if you're a fish. And you see this really interesting pattern here. Look at May, June, and July, and August, right? Um, the biomass, the mean biomass on the top is, is almost flat across those months in, the, in, the, in a slight change, although the diversity changes. But the number of bugs per time actually increases the concentration, the number of bugs per time per unit flow, uh, increases between June and July and then drops off again in August. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of the fish behavior patterns that we, that we saw. Um, so if we plot this, that same plot again, right, I'm just overlaying, right, the, the, the movement patterns of the fish to the concentration of the drifting invertebrates that were moving into those pools. So I thought that was, that jumped out at me as something I ought to look into more. Um, okay, so moving on from there. Another thing that, that struck me that I did not expect was the size of my drifting invertebrates decreased from June to July to August. So a slight increase from May to June and then decreased. So this is uh, the average size of bug in my drift net. Um, and I realized later it's probably a function of the transport capacity of flow, right? As flow is dropping, it's, it's drifting smaller bugs, but also is it a function of life history diversity in the invertebrates themselves? Are there different bugs drifting? So I wanted to know, are the bugs in May and June different than the bugs in July and August? So um, we did some NMDS work just to just to get an idea of if they're different we looked at the abundance of the different taxa that we saw um, and it's a mess may may june and july is a mess but august is clearly different in terms of the abundance of those taxa and then i started looking at it, i realized even though we have all these different bugs that were coming into the drift net uh, about uh, four four different families here made up about 70 percent of the invertebrates that i found so i said what's going on with those four families so we have uh, the beta days Brachycentrids, chironomids, and simulids. The brachycentrids are really interesting. They're a very small caddis fly, like a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. Two millimeters is a big brachycentrid. Um, but they were dominant in terms of numbers of, of bugs um, in my drift nets, and they increased May, June to July, and dropped off in August. Again, following that pattern of fish behavior that we saw. When we look at this in terms of a concentration, uh, it's even more stark, right? Um, but then, when we look at this in terms of biomass with these same four orders, it's a lot messier. And it's a lot messier because brachycentrids are tiny, right? They don't weigh much. They don't, so it's like a little tiny tofu burger coming by as opposed to a big, tiny, big giant hamburger floating by. But th the question is, if you're a fish, is a whole lot of tofu burgers better than one or two hamburgers, right? And when you think about it in terms of concentration, uh, you, you take these same, these same uh, rate of bugs of these four families per hour per unit flow. Again, it follows this pattern of increasing uh, biomass per concentration through to July and then a drop off in August. So net biomass, remember, uh, uh, for all bugs is almost flat, but the biomass of these four most abundant species per unit flow is increasing. So there also could be a preference. Uh, this, this could indicate that you have um, you know, a site preference in terms of you're picking off prey that you have adapted to, to, to see, that, that you're seeing a lot, right? Um, <clears throat> So this is also fo following that same pattern of fish uh, movement through time. So what's my job now? My job is to take this information and try to coerce it into a management prescription. How can we find environmental drivers that are, that are uh, affecting these, these fluxes that are affecting fish behavior, and how can we use those in management? So I'm working on that now, and uh, any questions? <clears throat> I don't think we have time for any questions. <laughs> One yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at volume of flow, yeah. a lot of spatial feeding areas. Thank you. A lot of the spatial feeding areas, though, for um, fish are actually two dimensional and do not change linearly with volume changes like the surface area or the bottom. Um, it's only more the 
the midstream, which would be more insects as they hatch out. So one thing that struck me about this is, you know, when we build two-dimensional models to predict fish behavior, like PF sim model or something like that, um, we think of it in, in mean column average water velocity. What really blew me away is how three-dimensional the hydraulics are in these pools and how the fish are responding to three-dimensional characteristics in flow. You can have a barrel of flow, which is bringing drift rate in and then causing it to slow down so your um, so your the, the residence time of a bug in that pool is a lot slower and the fish can respond to it as it gets caught in that barrel and your mean water column velocity could be zero but you have two feet per second on the surface and negative two feet per second uh, near the bed and so that three-dimensional characteristics of flow had a huge I think had a huge effect on, on the behavior of the fish um, yeah and then can I follow up with another question um, were you able to determine the size of the fish when you were looking at I did. those nose points to yeah. see if that so I did measure the, the length of the fish um, uh, for each fish that I that I quantified um, and there are some length relationships I just wasn't able to, to get to it today so thanks appreciate it